Um, my name is Patricia. I'm a bookseller at Malapop's Bookstore. I'm here this evening with my colleague and director of author events, Stephanie Jones Byrne. Uh, thank you for joining us for this hybrid event where we have you, the virtual audience, and then our in person audience as well. Tonight, and I want to show this fantastic cover here, we have Peter Zoitlin, and he is going to do a presentation about his latest book, Spin, a novel based on a mostly, mostly true story. Let me tell you just a little bit about Peter. He's the author of the New York Times bestseller, Rescue Road, A Man, 30,000 Dogs, and A Million Miles on the Lost Hope Highway. Uh, he's got several more books, and I know you want to hear mostly about the one we're going to talk about tonight. If you are interested in ordering a copy of Peter's book, Spin, you can do so on our website and we can have that signed uh, for you. So just uh, to let you know, that's available at malaprops.com. So it's my pleasure to introduce this evening, Peter Zoidlin for Spin. Thank you. Thanks to Malaprops for hosting and um, we're getting used to these in-person events. I just had my first in-person event in a couple of years yesterday. So thanks to everybody who's joining us virtually. Um, so I mean, we can turn off the lights if it's possible. It might be easier for people to see, but it's okay. Okay, it's, uh, uh, just, have to be, it's right. just one second. Yeah, proceed that's fine. So thanks for coming everyone. And thanks to Malaprops. And this is also co-sponsored by the Jewish Community Center of Asheville. The story I'm going to tell you about tonight is a, a, a woman who's at the center of the story. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about her. I'm going to tell you how I came to this story because uh, I really fell into it in an unusual way. As I said, this book is based on a true story. I'm going to tell you about the woman at the heart of it. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the social and historical context in which this round the world bicycle trip took place. And then a little bit about um, the trip itself. So as was mentioned, this is uh, my first novel, my ninth book, um, and I'll tell you how it came about. For me, this really all began in 1993 with a letter from a complete stranger addressed to my mother, who said he was researching the story of the first woman to go around the world on a bicycle, and his gene the genealogical portion of his research had led him to my mother. He thought that she might somehow be related to this woman, and my mother read the letter, she didn't ring a bell at all. She knew nothing of it. She'd never heard of this woman. And she asked me to respond to this gentleman on her behalf. And I explained that he had found the right family. That was pretty much clear from the information in his letter. He had found the, the right family, um, but we couldn't help him. In that letter, it enclosed two newspaper articles, one from a Boston newspaper and another from a newspaper in Omaha. Nebraska um, about this woman's bicycle journey in the 1890s. 10 years later, after nothing happening, I asked, asked some people in my family if they'd ever heard of her along the way. Nobody, everybody came up blank. Nobody had ever heard of her. 10 years later, the same gentleman sent me a letter again. He said, have you learned anything in the 10 years since I last wrote to you? I said, no, and I got to thinking, this is such an unusual story, such an incredible story about a woman going around the world on a bicycle in the 1890s. Why had no one in my family ever heard of her? So I decided to try and dig into it myself. There was nothing on the internet about her. The story had been completely lost to history. The newspaper article from, the, from Boston had indicated that the trip had started at the state house in Boston, the Capitol building. So I called the state library in the state house. And the woman who answered the phone without even hesitating said, I know we don't have anything about her here because I just got an inquiry from a gentleman in Texas a few weeks ago asking about her as well. And I was taken aback though, maybe I've got a long lost relative in Texas I've never heard of. Who else would be on to this story or have any interest in it? So the librarian of the state house offered to connect me with this fellow down in Texas. And I emailed him and I explained that I was distantly related to the woman that he was researching 
and I was interested to find out who he was. And I got an email in response, said, oh my God, a relative of Annie Londonderry's. And I will come to tell you why she had the name Londonderry, because that was not her given name in a moment. It turns out this gentleman, Dennis McCown, professor in Austin, was not related to me in any way, but he told me a story. I said, how did you get onto this? And he told me a story that I'm gonna tell you now that persuaded me that I had to chase this story down. It took me years. Dennis was researching the story of an ancestor of his own, a woman named Helen Morose, who lived in El Paso in 1895. Helen was married to a man named Martin Morose, who had been arrested on a cattle rustling charge in El Paso, and he escaped across the river into Mexico. And I'm listening to the story as Dennis is telling it to me and wondering where in the world is this going? He said, Martin was in Mexico, Helen was in El Paso. She needed a lawyer to help him. And who did she hire? She hired John Wesley Harden, who is now practicing law in El Paso. He had been in his younger years, the most notorious gunslinger of the old west. Official records have, have it that he killed at least two dozen men by the time he was in his early 20s. The real toll was probably closer to 60. He had spent half his life in prison and he was now practicing law in El Paso. Helen and Hardin fell into a very passionate romance. And on a night in July of 1895, four men hired by Hardin, Lord Martin Morose, his lover's husband, back to El Paso and murdered him at the El Paso city dump. Dennis was wondering where was Hardin on the night of the murder as he paid for it. And from the newspaper accounts in El Paso, what he came to learn was that he was sitting in an audience with Helen by his side, listening to a lecture by a young woman from Boston going around the world on a bicycle, my great grand aunt. This story seems so fantastic to me that my Jewish great grand aunt from Boston had somehow crossed paths with the most notorious outlaw of the Old West. I was hooked. I figured I've got to find out what happened. Dennis had collected a bunch of stories from the El Paso newspapers because she was quite a sensation by the time she reached El Paso a year into her trip. And one of them contained a very important clue that helped me get on her trail, so to speak. One of the articles mentioned that when she left El Paso by bicycle, she was headed north following the Santa Fe railway tracks. I was able to get an old map of the Santa Fe and I started calling librarians in the little towns up and down this, this, this railway line. And so I'm looking for newspaper articles about a woman named Annie Londonderry. She might've passed through your town and I would give them a range of dates. And sure enough, every single time something came back. And I was able to start pinpointing her travels on a map a year into her journey. At the same time, I hired a specialist in Jewish genealogy to see if I could find any other distant relatives of mine who might shed light on the mystery. And I'll come back to that. So who was the woman at the center of this extraordinary journey? Who was Annie Londonderry? It was not her real name. She was born Annie Cohen, you can dance each one, it'll come up. Yeah. She was born Annie Cohen in, uh, she was my great grandfather Bennett's sister. She was born around 1870 in Riga, Latvia and came here at about the age of five with her two older siblings and her parents and settled in Boston. She was married as a teenager to a man named Max Kopchatz. She had never ridden a bicycle except for a couple of lessons before she set off to go around the world from Boston. Now, one of the early newspaper accounts that I found from New York about her trip revealed something important to me and was rather startling. And it was not reported in any of the thousands of newspaper accounts or about a thousand that I was able to find about her trip from all around the world. Um, sorry, <laughs> someone at the door. Um, and that was that she was a young mother of three small children at the time that she made this bicycle trip around the world. And at first I was absolutely startled, you know, that a woman of the 1890s could leave her three small children for 15 months to go around the world on a bike. 
But as much as that was kind of shocking, it was also gave me optimism because I realized that these children had children of their own. They might still be alive and I might be able to find them and maybe really solve the mystery of Annie Londonderry. She was by one newspaper description, an inventive genius. She was a brilliant self promoter. She was a master at creating her own myth and, and, and creating a whole new personality as she traveled, a whole new persona. She had a casual relationship with the truth and we're gonna talk about that. And it's why the subtitle of the novel is based on a mostly true story. To give you some example of her inventive genius, at various times during the journey, she told reporters, number one, she was a Harvard Medical student. Being naive, I called Harvard Medical School looking for her transcript only to be told that women were not allowed to attend Harvard Medical School until the 1940s, a half a century later. She claimed to be a lawyer, an accountant, a wealthy heiress, an orphan, the inventor of a new type of stenography, the founder of a newspaper, the cousin of a congressman, the niece of a senator. None of this was true. She took great liberties with her own personal story, as we'll see with her accounts of her travels, because she was all about building her fame. And she knew that the more sensational she appeared, the more famous she would become. She understood what the mavens of Silicon Valley understand. Well, attention equals money. And we'll see why how money came into this. I spent four years researching this story and wrote another book about her before the one that I'm talking to you about tonight, in which I tried to sort out the fact from the fiction. because She was writing her own historical fiction in real time. Some publishers at the time encouraged me to, to write it as historical fiction, but I thought that would defeat the whole purpose. The story had been totally lost to history. Nobody would know what really happened if I didn't do my best to tell the story as it really happened. So I wrote this book in 2007. Fast forward to just two years ago, uh, two years ago in November. If you read the New York Times, you know they've been doing a series of overlooked obituaries. They call it overlook. People of color and women who were overlooked by the Times in their day and who probably deserved the New York Times obituary, but never got it. I didn't know this was coming. It relied a lot on my, that book I just mentioned to you. And when this obituary appeared, my wife, Judy, who's here, she, who, her, her business is dealing with book clubs is all over the country. She knows what book clubs are reading. She said, you've got to write this as historical fiction because all my book club people want to read historical fiction about women and learn something about a period in time they didn't know. And Judy, who is a source of a lot of really good ideas, said, you've got to do it. Now, I had never written a novel before. I'd written eight books, but never a novel. At first, I thought I'd be humoring her. I would write 20 pages. I would send them to my agent. She would affirm that I had no business writing a novel. Uh, but long story short, she liked the first 20 pages, and she told me to keep going. So a little bit more about Annie. But that, that was the impetus for writing Spin talk more about it. When Annie came here as a young girl, her family settled in the old west end of Boston, a neighborhood that's long disappeared in the urban renewal wave of the 1950s. But it was the most diverse, ethnically diverse neighborhood in the country in that era. The neighborhood in a very compact part of the city lived African Americans, Irish, Poles, Germans, Jews. It was a real melting pot. And a young woman with dreams beyond the Charles River um, would have soaked in the cultures of a lot of, you know, of all parts of the world and smelled the foods cooking in the summer and heard a lot of different languages spoken. But what this bike trip was in many ways about was escape. By the time she was in her early 20s, Annie was already the mother of three children and she had no patience or interest in domestic life. And this <laughs> illustration from Punch Magazine, I don't know that she was the model for it, but this is the year after her trip and it, it's an absolutely accurate depiction of her life circumstances. Her husband 
three toddlers at home and a real independent streak. But what set her in motion? She, she was looking for an escape. It was reported all over the world in all the newspaper accounts I was able to collect. And there were a lot because she was such a gifted self-promoter. It all began with a wager. This was reported all over the world between two wealthy Boston uh, industrialists, big money in those days, 20,000 to 10,000 that a woman couldn't make it around the world on a bicycle. And we'll talk about why the bicycle was so important in this. There were conditions. She had to make the trip in 15 months and ride at least 10,000 miles on the bicycle. She had to begin without a penny in her pocket and earn $5,000 en route, very formidable sum of money. The idea here was this is not just going to be a test of a woman's physical endurance and mental fortitude. It was going to be a test of a woman's ability to fend for herself in the world. She was to win a substantial prize if she succeeded. And when I say there were other conditions added along the way, what I mean is that Annie was pretty freewheeling about making up additional conditions to suit her purposes as a way of explaining things she was doing. A lot of reporters that spoke to her, almost all men, were quite smitten with her. She told some of them she wasn't allowed to contract matrimony during the trip, although she was already married. In France, she told reporters she was not allowed to speak French, according to the terms of the wager. She didn't speak French. So she, and she sometimes justified taking things by train by saying she had a, an allowance to travel a certain number of miles by train. So Annie, the social and historical context for this is really important to understanding why she was able to succeed in becoming world famous for this, this trip. She seized on three of the big social trends of her time. I'll mention them briefly and then discuss each one in turn briefly. One was this was an era of globalization. The telegraph was transmitting news around the world in a matter of minutes or hours. You could sail from New York to France in less than a week. So at the end of the 1800s, People's imagination about the world, the bigger world was being fired up. This was also a time of intense interest in bicycling in Europe and the United States. The sport very popular among men and now increasingly popular among women. And she seized on the women's movement for social change and equality. As we'll see, the bicycle became an emblem of the women's suffrage movement. It would literally be impossible to overstate how important the bicycle was in changing the lives of women at the turn of the 20th century. Now, talk about globalization. If Annie's trip has echoes of others you've heard about, it, there's a lineage to it. In 1872, again, capturing this interest in global, you know, in the, in the larger world, Jules Verne's novel Around the World in 80 Days was published in which the protagonist, Phileas Fogg, wagers $4,000 with his fellow club men in London that he can make it around the world in less than 80 days. And that book became quite a sensation. And then there was a series of round the world journeys. One of them important for our purposes, this one, the first person around the world on a bike, Thomas Stevens, riding one of these high wheel bicycles. But perhaps the most famous of these journeys and the one that I am sure inspired Annie because she would have been old enough to take it in, and it was a sensation nationwide, was Nellie Bly's trip around the world. Nellie Bly was the most famous journalist of her day, um, but she's most famous for this stunt she did for the Pulitzer Papers. She said she could break the record of around the world in 80 days by traveling nor normal means of conveyance, ships, trains, and so forth. And so she set off from uh, Jersey City, New Jersey, <coughs> and became an absolute sensation in the American press for this. And she wrote about her journey for the Pulitzer Papers. These were like the reality television stars of their era. People were following their journey with great interest. And it was such a popular journey that when she came back, McLaughlin Brothers produced this very popular parlor game called, board game called Around the World uh, with Nellie Bly. So these were kind of the, you know, the, the, this is the legacy that she was continuing. Now, as to the bicycle craze, initially the bicycle craze was limited mainly to men. 
because high wheel bicycles were the only bicycles that existed and they were very difficult to get on, uh, let alone even ride. A few women raced them, but very few women rode them recreationally. What opened the sport to women was the development of the safety bicycle, which is it's pretty much the geometry that we know of uh, bicycles today. They were literally safer. That was what gave them their name. And women started buying bicycles by the millions in the 1890s, but not without controversy. The bicycle really became a freedom machine for women, but it challenged every Victorian notion of female propriety. And as a result, the moral, you know, was it, People were morally offended that women sometimes would be seen riding bicycles, you know, showing some of their leg and exerting themselves and sweating. It's considered very unfeminine. Uh, doctors even got into the debate. Some took the position that women who got into cycling would not be able to bear children. Some were concerned that <laughs> cycling would be sexually stimulating for women. So this was this whole debate was raging as women uh, took to the bicycle. The bicycle as we'll see, also forced changes in the way women dressed. And Annie's attire on her trip is emblematic of this transformation. I'll talk more about that. So getting a bicycle in the 1890s was literally a way for a woman to declare her independence. Now, advertisers very much aware that women didn't want to be seen as surrendering their, surrendering their femininity portrayed women this way in their ads for bicycles. You can see these are women sort of up on a pedestal and being seen as, as goddesses, probably reassuring to women that you, know, you can still be feminine on a bicycle. And as I mentioned, so many women took the bicycles as a freedom machine, so it became an emblem of the suffrage movement. And the year after Annie's trip ended in an interview with Nellie Bly, Susan B. Anthony said, bicycling had done more to emancipate women than anything else in the world. So that's the backdrop. And now I'm gonna just take you very briefly through the journey itself, uh, which began in June of 1894, as I mentioned here on the steps of the Massachusetts <coughs> State House. The, uh, I mentioned earlier that I had hired a Jewish genealogist to try and help me find some direct living descendants if I could. A year after my research began, I got a call one night from the genealogist. I think I've got it. She found the cemetery where Annie and her husband and their three children, the three oldest children, there were the four, um, were buried. And there was a contact person listed in the cemetery records, a woman named Mary Goldiner in Larchmont, New York. I didn't recognize the name. I didn't know if she was related to me. I didn't know if she was still alive and if she was, if she'd even care to hear from me. But I wrote her a letter, I explained who I was. And I explained what I was interested in, in this trip. And 10 days later, the phone rang and this woman, and a woman's voice said, Peter, this is your long lost cousin, Mary. And I almost fell out of my chair because I, this was great news. This was hopefully gonna open up a whole new world for me in terms of the research. And a week later, I was in her living room in Larchmont, New York, and getting to know her. And we went in the dining room and there was a photograph in a frame of Annie, I'm gonna show it to you in a minute. It was the first photograph I'd ever seen of this great grandmother I'd been chasing around the world for a year. And I had read in the Boston newspapers that her first stop after she left the state house was the town portrait studio on Washington Street in Boston. The photograph that it, she had was in a frame and the bottom was cut off. I asked her to take it out of the frame. And sure enough, it was that photograph that I had read about formal portrait she had at the beginning of her trip. And there was the logo. So this is Annie the day she left Boston. I just point out a few things. You can look, first of all, look at the clothing. Imagine how impractical that was for cycling in the park, let alone going around the world. The bicycle, which was given to her by the Columbia Bicycle Company, a woman's dropped frame bicycle, she could, could not ride a man's frame bicycle with these long skirts. This was a Sherman tank by normal standards, which weighed 42, our standards, weighed 42 pounds. If you look at the rear wheel, you'll see a chain mesh, that, that, that mesh, and I'll show you a close-up of it, was designed to keep the skirts from getting caught up in the spokes. 
the, on the back of the bike was also a placard, Londonderry, the name under which she, she rode. This was the logo of the Londonderry Lithia Spring Water Company of New Hampshire. The first of many corporate sponsors, she signed up in the course of her trip because so, she had to earn her way around the world and she had to earn $5,000 en route. And she was very clever. She pioneered sports related marketing for women. And we'll see more about that in a moment. This is an example when she reached Denver of how the water company seized on her growing fame to promote the water. This is my favorite description of her departure from Boston, one of the Boston papers, and carrying only a change of clothes and a pearl handled revolver. Miss Londonderry sailed away like a kite down Beacon Street. Um, the pearl handled revolver, she brandished in front of reporters throughout her journey. It, um, it added a lot of drama and sensation. It, it, it imparted a sense of danger and adventure, which she took great advantage of. Um, Annie spent the first days riding to New York City. She had no real uh, plan, but um, she reached New York and she spent a month there, even though the clock was ticking, introducing herself to the newspapers trying to adapt her clothing to make it more practical for riding. And this is how she was depicted in the New York World newspaper. Um, I think we're way ahead on the uh, Zoom though. Yeah, uh, sorry, just another technical glitch. Yeah, that's I okay, I'll keep going. Catch back up. Just keep going. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, now from New York City, Annie decides to ride north to Albany. Now, if you think about this, it geographically makes very little sense. She could have ridden from Boston due west to Albany in about three days, but now she's going back up to Albany. And the reason was very practical. You could follow the Erie Canal across New York State on these towpaths. These were the paths that the teams of oxen or horses would pull the barges up the canal. It was flat. So you had flat riding by following uh, the canal. It takes her four months. By the way, there were very detailed maps and booklets that you could buy that gave you, for cyclists, that gave you detailed instructions all the way from New York to Chicago. I mean, turn by turn, which she followed. She arrives in Chicago, worn out. Four months of the 15 have kicked off the clock. <coughs> and she spent. She realizes her, this was terrible planning. She's never going to make it across the plains and the mountain west for the winter. So she decides to give up the ghost and she says, I'm just gonna ride back to New York and try and set a speed record. That was to you know, try and save face. But something important happened in Chicago that caused her to change her mind yet again. This bicycle given to her by the Sterling Bicycle Company. Um, so you can see it was a man's bicycle. Um, uh, it weighed 21 pounds instead of 42. Now, I want to tell you where this picture came from. When I was at her granddaughter's house in Larchmont, Mary's husband went down the basement while we were talking, and he came up with some dusty boxes. I had read in the newspaper accounts in El Paso that she actually had a slideshow that she used to lecture, like, like the night that she met John Wesley Harden. He came up with these boxes, and I opened them up, and there was the slideshow intact. 75 glass, what they were called lantern slides. This was gelatin between two pieces of glass. They're pretty thick, about two inches square. And she had had this picture of her bicycle taken in San Francisco uh, a year into her journey. And that's where that uh, came from. Now, with a man's bicycle, that required her to change clothing. She adopts bloomers, which is the only practical way to ride a man's bicycle. And this was, by the way, another, Sterling became another of her corporate sponsors. She appeared in advertisements. This is one of them. There was text that went with it, but this image appeared in many cycling magazines to advertise Sterling bicycles. There was at the time one other woman advertising Sterling bicycles, and that was Annie Oakley, who sometimes performed her marksman, markswoman uh, act on a bicycle, a Sterling bicycle. So Annie announces to the press she's going to go around the world. After all, she's going to travel eastward, just needs now to get back to Chicago, but only 11 months to do it. On her way back to New York, as her fame grows, she's quite adept at 
contacting newspapers in every city where she's you know, going to arrive and bicycle clubs or clubs throughout the country. And you can see that Buffalo Express describes her as a riding advertising agency. She would go into town, she had a price list. You could, and she would get your advertising banner. It might be 200 for her arm, 300 for a large space on her back. You could pin banners, or, you know, streamers to her bicycle. She would ride around for a few days, collecting fees from her advertisers. And this photograph from the Buffalo Express, it's, it's not visible, it's a poor quality reproduction. Her, the reason her sleeve looks white is that's an advertisement banner of some kind stitched onto her clothing. She makes it back to New York in November and sails to the North Coast of France. Now, really what I want to just say about France, because we are very briefly through a lot of this, is how the, the perception of the French about her differed so much from the perception of America. As you can see from this portrait she had taken in Chicago, she was an attractive young woman and every reporter, and again, all men who wrote about her here in the States had some comment, would be totally sexist to, to read it today, about her looks and her appearance and how shapely she was or whatever. But the French had a totally different take, partially because by the time she arrived, she was much more muscular from riding, you know, a couple of thousand miles on the bicycle, but I think was also French notions of femininity. And this is the way she was described in one French newspaper. And to give you a sense of how much she was bending gender stereotypes in the 1890s. Said Miss Londonderry belongs to that category of neutered beings, single women without a husband or children, which was not true. The suppression of love and maternal function so profoundly alters in them any feminine personality. They're neither men nor women and really constitute a third sex. And one of the illustrations in the French press depicts a much more masculine image of her. And by the way, you can see on her knee and her thigh, more advertising banners. She makes this trip through France, riding south to Marseille through the winter, often escorted by French cyclists, men from town to town. Now, she boards a steamship in Marseille and sets sail heading eastward. She's got a lot of time to make up. She's still on that steamship when it reaches Asia. Okay, she's, she's skipping across the water like a stone. She needs material for this lecture tour she's planning when she gets back to earn money. And she figures the best way to do it is to be a witness to the atrocity of the war between Japan and China over control of Korea. She was front page news in the American papers almost every day. She collects a lot of these lantern slides depicting these battles. She didn't see any of this. She couldn't have. The timeline makes it clear that was impossible. Um, but it didn't keep her from using this material to spin tall tales that would be of interest to these audiences eager to hear from this woman who traveled around the world. And to give you a sense of her flair for the dramatic, the next quote I'm going to show you is from her first person account of her trip published in the New York world a month after she finishes the trip, describing what she had seen at the war front. She said, while imprisoned in a thus imprisoned, a Japanese, she was claimed to have been imprisoned, a Japanese soldier dragged a Chinese prisoner to my cell, killed him before my eyes, and drank his blood while the muscles were still quivering. She had this sense for how to feed the beast, as they say. The New York world was a serious newspaper, but it was also part National Enquirer. And this was called yellow journalism. These papers competed in those days for sensational copy, and she was very gifted at providing it. Um, she sails now from Japan and arrives in California in early spring. This is how she's depicted disembarking in San Francisco. To give you an idea, how impulsive she was in conversation and how little she cared about sticking to one single consistent narrative of her own story. She told two different stories to two different reporters in San Francisco on the same day, and their stories were published on the same day. And in one, she describes this arduous overland 
trip by bicycle across India and China. And to the other, she said she took this steamer. She wasn't really, you know, it was just right about me. She didn't really care whether the story added up. Now, the next image, again, one of those lantern slides that I found at her granddaughter's house, gives you an idea of the lengths to which she went to prepare for these lectures and to prepare to spin her tall tales. She obviously had hired these guys. Nobody wandered by this scene, you know, stumbled upon this scene of these two bandits holding her up. And she often told reporters stories about being accosted by bandits uh, on her trip. The other thing to note is that she's now attired in a man's riding suit. She's not even in bloomers anymore. For a woman like on a man's bicycle attired in men's clothes, often covered with advertising streamers, arrives in a small town like Tucson, which had 5,000 people back then, at Phoenix at 3,000, she was an incredible curiosity. You know, she didn't run away to join the circus, she ran away to become the circus. She has a leisurely trip from San Francisco to Los Angeles. It takes six weeks in the company of a young male cyclist, a well-known cyclist from San Francisco named Mark Johnson. It's a trip that could have taken a week and I'll leave it to your imagination. And I, I imagine what happened in Spin in the novel about why it took her so long to travel to LA in the company of this handsome young cyclist. He leaves her in Los Angeles. She now is headed eastbound through the desert towards El Paso and that encounter with John Wesley Harden. The advice she got was follow the railway tracks. And this was important for cyclists going across. I mean, you can, you've, if you've driven this part of the country, you know how desolate it can be now. Back then, on a bicycle, if you didn't follow the railway tracks, you could be completely disoriented. You could get lost, never to be seen again. So the idea was to follow the tracks. You wouldn't get lost. And if you had a truck, if you had an emergency, eventually a train would come by. Now, this illustration in her newspaper story for the New York world, when I first saw it, I thought this image is pretty fanciful, but in fact, and this was true in New York, she, the newspapers wrote about it. If the ground nearby wasn't passable, you literally had to ride the rails. Very bruising, brutal way to ride a bike. Um, but the other important thing to notice in this is the caption, is the byline on her story wasn't Annie Londonderry or Annie Cohen. It was Nellie Bly Jr. I mentioned the famous journalist before. The real Nellie Bly had an on again, off again relationship with the editors at the World. She had left in a huff a couple of months before Annie's story appeared. And my surmise is that this was their way of telling her, we don't need you. We've got another Nellie Bly uh, coming up behind you. And there were a lot of women they called sensation writers in this era, and Annie would briefly become one uh, after the trip. But this is the headline from her first person account. And I've skipped over a lot of ground. I'll just tell you that she rode north to Denver and then east to Chicago, finishing the trip just within the 15 month time frame. And you can see the headline, you know, this the sensational nature of it. Uh, and again, the reference to Neville Bly Jr. shot by Chinese soldiers thrown into prison by the Japs and a diary of 15 months in her bloomers, around the world in her bloomers. The first paragraph in the story is, is this, first line. She says, I'm a new woman. That was the term that referred to generically to women who were you know, sort of pushing the boundaries of what was acceptable in those days. If that term means I believe I can do anything any man can do. When I met Mary, her granddaughter, who knew Annie well because Mary was 16, when Annie died and they were very close. I said, was your, do you think Annie was a feminist? She said, not in the sense that she was like out petitioning or marching or she wasn't a political activist. But she said, I believe she was a feminist in the sense that she truly believed that a woman had every much of a right as a man to control her own destiny and to write her own story, which she literally did, uh, albeit with some harsh consequences for the children she had left behind. She returns from the bike trip and she reunites with her husband, Max. This is a picture of them taken late in their lives in the 1940s. 
They have a fourth child after the trip. And that child is Mary's mother. The three children who were essentially abandoned by their mother for 15 months, and then abandoned again, by the way, because when they reached school age, she dispatched them all to Catholic boarding schools. It's rather astonishing for a Jewish woman married to an Orthodox Jewish man. But that's what happened. Uh, and then, so it's not surprising, I suppose, in some ways, that those three oldest children didn't have children of their own. In spin, I won't give it away, but what happened is that to the oldest child is particularly interesting. I mentioned earlier that we had found the grave site where Annie was buried in New Jersey with her husband and three of their children. It was the three youngest children. The one that was five when Annie left on this trip was not buried with them. And I had just surmised, and this is before I met Mary, I just surmised that she had predeceased them. It was the only thing I could think of was to explain why the rest of the family would be buried together. And when I met Mary, I said, so what happened to Molly? This was the five-year-old. I said, she, she died young, I guess. And Mary started to cry and told me, I'm not gonna give it away unless the people really push it, they are online with questions. It was really astonishing what happened to the older child. And you begin to see the ripple effects of this decision to, to leave. And, you know, so I wrote in the first book about Annie that what she did was in some ways heroic, but she wasn't didn't always act heroically. And a lot of people can't get sort of past the fact that she abandoned these children. And I usually say two things. One is there are a lot of male explorers of that generation who did the same and that question's never raised, which isn't to say it wasn't a pretty selfish and harsh decision. But You've seen the bumper sticker that well-behaved women seldom make history. To be able to step this far outside the lines of what was acceptable took a pretty radical mindset. And in SPIM, um, I wanted to make sure that even though writing this historical fiction gave me license to create her in, in sort of any way I wanted, and to sort of take liberties with the story. I didn't want to take liberties with the fact that she was a complex person who sometimes made decisions that had tough consequences for other people. I didn't want to package her up in a pretty wrapping and put a bow on her, even though I had, you know, it was fiction. I just felt I had to be true to the complex character that she was. So thank you and everybody out there in virtual land for coming tonight. Do we have any questions from the audience? I've only been asking, kind of, I guess, more or less technical question about our itinerary. So she goes to, goes to France and then sails out of Marseille or someplace like that. Yeah. And then goes to someplace like Istanbul or someplace. So, like so the steamer, so the steamer stopped um, in Alexandria in Egypt. Oh at the north end of the Suez Canal where it was refueling. And I suspect, because in that collection of lantern slides I mentioned, about 12 of the 75, I think there were more originally, but 75 that survived, 12 of them were actually photographs of um, famous places in Jerusalem. And there was a way to get there. And I, I kind of worked the time frames. I know when the, the ship that she was on reached Alexandria and I know when it left. And it was feasible for her to have taken a boat to modern day Tel Aviv and then a narrow gauge railway for a day trip up to uh, Jerusalem and then get back in time to meet the boat. Oh. It would have been a tight time frame, and I, I addressed this in spin. I kind of imagined how that went. Now, the fact that those physical artifacts, those slides of Jerusalem were in her collection and, the, and people, you could purchase them like postcards. Um, that doesn't prove that they were purchased in Jerusalem. So I don't have any physical proof of, of her presence there, but I suspect she went. That um, same steamer then sails through the Suez, it stops in Colombo, Sri Lanka, then Ceylon, um, Saigon, Singapore, Hong Kong, 
and she's on board at all these stops. What she would do, for example, their newspaper accounts from um, Colombo, you know, Ceylon, she hooks up with some local cyclists and they do a 30 mile ride um, there. And she makes appearances in theaters in Saigon that I can document um, with her bicycle, for example. But she was, you know, this is, look, when I first started the research, I thought what I was out to prove was that she actually was entitled to call herself the first woman to go around the world on a bicycle. And they reached a point, and it wasn't that far into it, when I realized the timeline just wasn't adding up. And at first I was disappointed. But then the more I thought about it, the more I realized, okay, that's disappointing, but there's a more interesting story here. <laughs> there's a more complicated character and how she pulled this off. And you know, went from being an anonymous Jewish housewife with three kids and no one ever heard of to becoming a global sensation, short-lived, but a global sensation 15 months later. That in and of itself was an incredible achievement before Instagram and, you know, modern social media, but she did it. Um, now, the question that begs the question, what about, did she, did she claim victory in the wager? That I'll leave to you to read in, in both of those books because I'll just pose the question because her ability to spin these tall tales about herself and about her trip led me to ask, was there really a wager or was this something that she invented because it added so much drama to the whole enterprise because it turned it into a race around the world that was going to tell, you know, everybody would have a vested interest if you were depending, regardless of which side of the debate on women's equality you were on, she was either going to, you know, vindicate your, you know, win women, or she was going to fail and vindicate those who, you know, say a woman was not an equal of a man. And it often struck me that this was sort of an early version of the tennis match most of us remember when Bobby Riggs had washed up male pro said he could beat the best woman tennis player in the world and then lost Billie Jean King on national television. Um, so she was quite enterprising in a lot of ways. She was a much more complicated person than I ever expected when I started out. Yeah. Sorry, I'm back late and I missed the introduction, so I probably missed this, but what is your relationship with her? Uh, yeah, okay, so, um, question was, what was my relationship to this woman? She was my great grandfather's sister, which makes me her great grand nephew. Um, she died in 1947, six years before I was born, so we never overlapped. And I think in some ways writing spin was a way of doing something that, I've lived with this story now since 1993, when I first learned about her, not from my family, it was from a stranger was researching her story. I always wished in all that time I could have sat down with her just for an hour, you know, or more hopefully, and have her tell me her story. Um, and so Spin is, takes the form of a long letter writ written by her late in her life to her granddaughter to be opened on her granddaughter's 30th birthday, which would have been in 1960. I think it was my way of, I didn't realize this at the time, of my having her, you know, I mean, I was the pass through, but having her tell me her story as it might have unfolded. I mean, I took liberties with it because that's what you do in fiction. But I'm writing historical fiction about a woman who wrote her own historical fiction in real time. And so I've had some conversation with book groups, including one associated with the Jewish Community Center here in Asheville. And what people were always trying to figure out is, okay, what really happened? What did Annie make up? And what did the author make up? And because there's elements of all of that. But I also think I would say to, I say to people, it's not whether, there's also another category in there of things that are not necessarily provable or demonstrably true, but which I think are very plausible. So there's all of that mixed in. I think that's a 
great place to end, actually. Thank you. Unless we do have any more questions. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.